thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ranger Jen, and I'm here with a whole bunch of friends today um, to, uh, to commemorate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. We have a, a special program for you, and we are excited to be able to share some stories with you. And um, very soon you'll meet Ranger Susan, who is, who is a colleague of mine, who will uh, introduce the Martin Luther King Memorial. But before we do that, um, we want to thank our hosts, the Trust for the National Mall, our, par our partner in a lot of what we do. And I'm going to toss it on to, over to Edward, who will uh, say a few words. Edward. Thank you so much, Jen. So as Jen mentioned, I'm Edward. I'm the Director of Public Engagement Programs at the Trust for the National Mall. The trust is the lead partner of the National Park Service on the National Mall. So what does that mean? Uh, basically, it means that we are good friends who help each other out. Teamwork takes a lot of effort, especially in the face of great challenges and hardships. It takes courage, strength, determination, and much effort. Imagine helping bring together millions of people all over the country to be heard, always standing back up when pushed down, in the hope that the country does better together. That is what Dr. King did, but it wasn't just him. In August, 1963, hundreds of thousands of people came to the National Mall during the March on Washington. And I'm so glad to have a special guest to join us later today, who was there as a young child. It isn't just the adults whose voices are important. Your words and your actions matter a great deal. While the March on Washington happened almost 60 years ago, the legacy lives on and there's still work to do. If you get to visit the National Mall, and I hope you know that you are always welcome, you can walk in the footsteps of history and keep the march alive for a better future. Thank you so much for joining us today. At the end, you'll hear from another colleague of mine, Destiny Hodge, who will close us out. And now I'll hand it over to Ranger Susan to start the program and lead us on the virtual tour. Susan. Thank you so much, Edward and Ranger Jen, and hello to everybody joining us. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so that we can take a little march through history, just to get, making sure everybody can see my, my screen now. Are we good? Yep, okay, great. So yes, hi, I'm, um, Ranger Susan, and I'm coming to you here from the National Park Service, from the National Mall and Memorial Parks. Now, um, when you hear the words National Mall, that word mall might not bring to mind what you're, what you're seeing right here. In fact, what Ranger Jen and I have had people come to us who are standing right in this space and say, where is the mall? Because they're thinking shopping mall. But in this case, the National Mall uh, means uh, a big open space. And this is a picture, a part of the National Mall that's uh, taken from the top of the Washington Monument, looking out over, as you can see, some of the things that we take care of. We take care of uh, plants and water that you see here. There's animals down there like, like squirrels and hawks that you can't see in the picture. And then you see all these, these stone buildings and structures that are memorials. And we build memorials as a way to have a place for people to go to remember. So in this picture, closest to you can see a, a, one of the newer memorials, the World War II Memorial. But then in the distance, you probably see the memorial that's the first one that comes to everybody's mind when you think of the National Mall. You can see there with the columns, the Lincoln Memorial. And we're gonna come back to the Lincoln Memorial in a little bit. But I'm gonna start by talking to you about uh, this memorial that's over here on the left-hand side of your screen with that blue arrow pointing to it. Um, that is where you will find the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. And here is a picture of me in the Martin Luther King Memorial. I'm not there right now, I'm sitting in an office, um, but maybe you can tell from the, from the picture there how much I love this memorial. And I was lucky enough to be there when it opened. Um, and it always makes me happy to be able to talk to people 
about the memorial and about the work of Martin Luther King Jr. and all those who worked uh, for civil rights and justice. If you were to be in the memorial um, and see someone who looked like me there, um, you would know that, that they were a park ranger. And there's a couple of things that tell you that. One is that you can see me in my uniform there. I've got a gray shirt on and you can't see it um, right now, but uh, there's also green pants. We call that the uniform, the green and gray. Um, in the picture of me, I'm wearing a, I mean, in, in, in what you can see me, I'm wearing a green sweater right now. And what else in the picture do you see that lets you know that I am a park ranger? You can put it in the chat or if you're in the classroom, you can talk with your in, uh, others in your classroom. Maybe you notice that in the picture, I've got a badge right there. Over on, the, on my sleeve, you can kind of see the arrowhead that's the sign of the National Park Service. And then maybe the, the thing that people recognize the most, the ranger hat right there. Uh, because I'm sitting inside an office, I, I'm not wearing a hat right now inside, but whenever we're outside, we're wearing a hat. And that's how you know that there's a park ranger. That's someone who would love to tell you about where you are in a national park. Um, and answer any questions you have. So why do we have a memorial on the National Mall to Martin Luther King Jr.? If you think about it, the other memorials that are to people are all for presidents. We have a memorial for Abraham Lincoln, for Thomas Jefferson, for George Washington. And Dr. King is the only person with a memorial right the, a big memorial right there on the National Mall that wasn't a president. Um, he started out as, as a regular person who just wanted to bring change and became one of the most famous people in the country. So this is a picture of um, the idea for a memorial to Dr. King. The idea started with um, a fraternity. A fraternity is a club in college. And it was a fraternity that Dr. King had belonged to when he went to college called Alpha Phi Alpha. And members of that fraternity set out to get a memorial built to Dr. King on the National Mall. And it was a long, a lot of work that it took many, many years. Um, when they finally got the go ahead to go ahead and build a memorial, um, they um, found somebody to come up with a design, they had a contest. And what you're looking at here is just the idea, the picture of what this memorial would look like. It was gonna be right along the tidal basin, so you can see the water there. It was gonna have trees, and also it was gonna have this big wall here, so that when you come in, you're kind of surrounded by the wall, and some sort of statue. And then this, is a picture of you can see when that memorial came to life um, from that water of the tidal basin. Uh, and you can, you'll notice that the trees that are around it are some of the most famous trees on the National Mall, which are our cherry trees that bloom in the spring. And you can see all the people that have come there to see Dr. King's memorial. Susan, we have a question already. Yes, I'm ready. A, the difference, please, between a monument and a memorial? Oh, that is a great question. So the word memorial has the word memory in it. And part of the idea behind uh, remembering a memory of a memorial is it's often to someone who has died. Sometimes it's a person who has died. Sometimes it's to remember people in a war who have died where a monument um, can be just something that you want to commemorate and celebrate uh, in a monument. Uh, the reason that the Washington Monument is a monument and we don't call it a memorial is because people started planning it when George Washington was alive, but it didn't get built until way after he had died. Um, and Ranger Jen, if I mix, missed anything in that um, description that you want to jump in with, go right ahead. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, um, so this memorial 
um, for Dr. King is to remember um, not only his life, but his message, uh, what he was working for and what he had to say. And so if you'll notice in this picture of the memorial, you can see the statue of Dr. King, the huge stone granite statue of Dr. King. And then uh, in the plaza, you can see that wall that you saw in the drawing. And if you notice, we're from far away in this picture, so you can't really read them, but there are words on that wall. So not only is it kind of enclosing the area, but also there's a wall that has lots of different things that Dr. King said that he wrote, because he wrote a lot of books and he wrote other things. He gave speeches. He was known for giving really um, important speeches that inspired people and gave them encouragement and, and the idea that they wanted to, to, to work and to um, get involved in movements. Uh, things that called out when he thought things were wrong. He was also a, a preacher, a Baptist minister. So some of the speeches he gave were sermons that he gave in church. And so um, people who knew Dr. King and also people who worked on his papers picked out uh, from all the different things he said and wrote some key quotes from him that they thought really gave anybody who was visiting the memorial an idea of what Dr. King stood for and what he was working for. And the quotes aren't in any order. So it's not like you're going along in a story that start have a beginning and a middle and an end. You can walk around the memorial and read any quote and it would have some, be something meaningful. And even though it has the date and the place where uh, Dr. King said it or, or wrote it, it doesn't matter if you know what that event was about, uh, if you know the history, because the things he was, was saying are things that can be meaningful to everybody. Um, in this view of the wall, and you can see the Washington Monument there in the, in the distance, um, because it's taken from an angle, you can't really read the words, but I'll tell you what the, what the words are, and I'll tell you what the story is about this. Um, Dr. King was someone who spent most of his life standing up for when he saw that things were not fair and not right, things were wrong, particularly when it came to the way that Black people were treated in the country at the time. Um, they suffered a lot under situations of what we call segregation. Segregation means um, when Black people are told that they can't go certain places, that they can't use um, certain things, um, when they're treated as if they're different and less than because of the color of their skin. And Dr. King, was always standing up and saying that's not fair. And one of those times that he stood up was in a city in Alabama called Birmingham, um, where he joined in with people who lived in that city to um, take a stand. And one of the things they were doing was having marches and demonstrations in the streets of Birmingham. And uh, the police had told them, the city government had told them that that wasn't allowed. They had to stop. It was illegal. But they didn't stop because they thought it was more important to stand up. And so Dr. King was arrested and he went to jail. And while he was in jail in Birmingham, um, some other people who he thought were his friends, other ministers like him and other religious leaders, wrote him a letter. Uh, and they said, Dr. King, you know, we believe in the things that you're talking about too, but we don't think that you're standing up the right way. We think that you shouldn't come into our city and cause trouble like this. Why are you coming here and stirring things up? And so he wrote them a letter back and it was called the letter from Birmingham jail. And this quote that's closest to you right there is the answer that he gave them that he wrote in that letter. And he said, 
You want to know why I came to Birmingham? I came here because injustice is here. So the word justice refers to when things are right and fair. And the opposite of that is injustice, when things are not fair, when they're not right. And he said, there's injustice here, so I had to come here. And then this is the quote that's on the wall. He said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Now that's a lot of big words and Dr. King spoke in a very poet and wrote in a very poetic way. So you might not have caught all those words, but what he was saying was, you know, a lot of times we might stand up and say, that's not right, that's not fair when it's something that's affecting us personally. But Dr. King was calling on people to think more broadly, saying, you know what? We all are connected to each other. So if you see somebody else who's being treated unfairly and see something else that's wrong, that you should stand up then too. Because if something's hurting them, then it's affecting all of us. We're all connected to each other. So calling on people to take a stand, even when it's not something that had to do with them personally, that we should all stand up and work for what's right. Here's another quote that's in the memorial that's something that Dr. King said when he was at the National Mall, but maybe not the speech that you know about that we're going to talk about in a minute. It was earlier in 1959, he came and gave a speech, not at the Lincoln Memorial, but near the Washington Monument in a place called Sylvan Theater. And he was speaking to a bunch of young people and students who had uh, uh, were marching and demonstrating because of things that weren't fair in their schools. One of the places where things were segregated were in schools, that there were schools that black students went to and schools that white students went to and that they weren't allowed to go to school together. And also the schools for the black students um, weren't, uh, weren't equal. They, they didn't have good books or good, um, good school buildings and sometimes kids would have to ride buses long ways to get to one school even though there was another school that was in their neighborhood. Um, and so he was speaking to those kids who were standing up and saying this isn't fair. And he said to them, you know, I'm so impressed with you. He said, I can tell that you will not take no for an answer and that the only answer you will settle for is total desegregation and total equality now. And that's what he believed in too. And then the last thing he said to those students was make a career of humanity. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a greater person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a finer, finer world to live in. So if you stand up, against injustice, then you, if you're going to make yourself a better person, you're going to help your country, and you're going to help the world. And when we all do that together, then we can make a difference. Now, as people come into the memorial and they see that the words of Dr. King are all around and they start reading his words, there's often one phrase that they're looking for, the words that they think of when they think of Dr. King. If you can, put it in the chat. What words do you think people are looking for when they think of Dr. King? If anybody answers. A bunch of uh, responses already to saying, I have a dream. I have a dream. That's right. And that's one of the things that come, people come up to park rangers and say, where does it say, I have a dream? Now, if you look at these, this picture of the words, I have a dream, you might notice that this is not a picture of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. Those of you who really know, 
the National Mall might recognize that this is actually a picture on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It doesn't say the words, I have a dream in the Martin Luther King Memorial. And sometimes people get upset about that. They think, well, it should be there. And that was a decision that the designers of the memorial made because they said, you know, everybody thinks that I have a dream, but we want people to really think about, well, what was Dr. King talking about? What was his dream? What did he imagine? And so the words all around the memorial are some of those things that were part of his dream, like um, that we have to all fight against injustice because we're all connected to each other, that we should make a career of humanity. So they wanted people to stop and think a little bit. If you're not finding what you're expecting, maybe you'll pay more attention to what's there and find something you didn't expect. But of course, they couldn't leave that speech out altogether. So the I have a dream speech is there in the memorial. It's there in words and it's there even in more than words. So this is a picture of, it's kind of a close up picture of what it might look like as you're walking into the memorial. And if you notice as you're walking into the memorial through the entrance, you can see across the tidal basin, across the water there, and see another memorial there on the National Mall. Um, you can only see part of it in this picture, but um, maybe you recognize that with the dome and the pillars as the Thomas Jefferson Memorial, looking out over the memorial um, that remembers the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence and said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Dr. King would often talk about Thomas Jefferson and the founding of the nation, but that things were not fair for everybody and think people were not being treated equally, even though the nation said that's what we stand for. And so in the I Have a Dream speech that he delivered during the March on Washington, there's a part that you know that, that he's talking about maybe where he's talking about look, I have a dream that we could live up to that thing that Thomas Jefferson was talking about. We could be a country of equality and justice and freedom. And so he talked about all of these things that he thought could happen and the ways that in places where people were being treated the worst, where there was violence and all kinds of oppression, that one day he had a dream that that would be a place people would look to as an example of freedom, things would get better and they'd be so much better that they would be an example of what could be good. Now, if you lived in one of those places and you had been suffering under the way things were not living up to equality and justice, you might've heard those words and thought, there is no way that can't happen. And Dr. King recognized that. He recognized their despair. Do you know that word despair? Despair is the feeling when you think things are so bad. I don't see how it could ever get better. It's hopeless. This will never happen. So Dr. King talked about his dream, about what he really believed could happen. And then he said this, and I'm gonna play the little clip of what he said. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. So those are the words from the I Have a Dream speech that are on the memorial. Out of that mountain of despair, a stone of hope. So you can see when you come into the memorial, you're coming in through that mountain. Sometimes I talk about lots of park service places take care of mountains, but not the National Mall. But this is our mountain that we take care of, that you come in through that mountain of despair. And then you see that the statue that Dr. King's coming out of is the stone of hope. So we look at 
all the things that have changed, that people have worked and struggled and things have gotten better. And so you can see um, that we can get hope from the things that have changed, but then also recognize that there's still a lot of work to do. And there are still things that we have to stand up for, but not to be, not to be in despair, have hope. So this is a picture of the statue looking straight on at it. Um, and you can see that it's Dr. King with his arms crossed, looking very determined, coming out of that stone. But do you notice anything in this statue that it looks like is missing? Is there anything missing? What do you think? Some are saying his legs. Yeah, his legs and his feet. Dr. King doesn't have any feet in this statue. And isn't that interesting? Because Dr. King was known not just for speaking, but for marching, for going to the places where things were wrong and standing up and saying, we need to confront the things that are wrong and make a stand with our very presence there. So how come he doesn't have any feet? Well, maybe one of the things that this statue reminds us is that Dr. King didn't get to finish the work. We know that those words that Dr. King used and those things that Dr. King did that inspired some people and got some people thinking, uh, working for good, made other people angry, people who didn't want things to change. And one person who was really angry about it shot him and killed him when he was only 39. So he didn't get to finish the work that he started. But you know, this is not work that any one person can finish. It takes lots and lots of people over a long time working and marching and standing up. And so maybe this statue tells us that we have to be Dr. King's feet. And so now you might know that Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which we marked yesterday, is uh, called a day of service, a day on, not a day off. And so this is a picture of that memorial 10 years ago um, when a bunch of students came to help to give service by taking care of the memorial, by spreading mulch and doing other things in the gardens there to keep it beautiful. So. Did any of you do anything yesterday to be a day of service? You can put it in the chat. And while you're telling us about anything that you've done yesterday or any other time that you've stood up and done some service like Dr. King called us to, I'm gonna take us back to that other memorial that we talked about, the Lincoln Memorial, to the most, maybe one of the most famous speeches that Dr. King ever gave. The March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom on August 28th, 1963. You can see the pin that was used at the time on the left and on the right is a picture of Dr. King waving to the crowd. As you might notice, he's got the pin uh, pinned to his jacket. And that's where he gave those famous words, I have a dream. On the left, you can see him talking a little bit more quietly, kind of walking through all of the struggles that everybody's been going through and all of the things he was calling on people to do to keep marching, to keep working, to keep fighting, even though things were hard, even though it looked like sometimes that, that it was hopeless. And he called on people not to let themselves give in to anger and hate at the people that were treating them wrong, to keep answering hatred with love, to keep answering violence with peace. And then on the right, you can see him at the very end of the speech after he imagined how things could be saying, free at last, free at last. Um, we love these pictures in the National Park Service because you might notice that ranger hat the ranger badge, the ranger arrowhead. There were, so this was a national park. So there were two park rangers there that day helping Dr. King and helping deal with all the people who came out to see 
the the speech look at these are some pictures you think of those pictures you saw of the wide open spaces and imagine every one of those spaces filled with over 250,000 people there were even people climbing up in the trees to see and there were some kids in that crowd too including this one girl that a photographer caught a picture of you can see her in the crowds near a fence holding a pennant from that day march on washington for jobs and freedom with the picture of the lincoln memorial and it says i was there on there so look at that picture for a second imagine you were at the march on washington do you wonder what was this girl thinking? What was that experience like for her to be there and hear Dr. King's speech? I'm gonna stop sharing now and turn things over to Dr. Jen, uh, to Ranger Jen, sorry. <laughs> Who's going to- smarter. Yeah, <laughs> I've said doctor so many times. Who's gonna Anybody have, have any thoughts about that photo and what um what that girl might have been thinking about? Maybe you're discussing it in your classrooms. I sure hope so. Um, but we have a real treat now because we get to find out from that girl herself. She is with us here today. Um, Miss Edith Lee Payne was that girl who was at the March on Washington. And she has joined us today, I'm very excited to say, um, to tell us about her experience at the March on Washington. We've gotten to know her at the National Mall because she comes back and visits us on occasion. And um, we've gotten to talk to her and, and hear her story, but we really wanted to give you all a chance to, to get to meet her and maybe ask some questions. So if you have any questions, I've got a couple I'm gonna start with. Um, first off, I wanna know what she was thinking in that picture. And maybe she'll tell you too about her surprise about that picture. And um, you all um, think about some questions you might have for Miss Edith and we're really excited to have her join us today. Well, hello, thank you so much, Dr. Ranger Jen. <laughs> um, it, it's such a pleasure for me to join you all and have an opportunity to share with you uh, what I was doing, why I was there that day and, and what I was thinking about. First, to be honest, um, I didn't know when that picture was taken, but I can tell you that my thoughts of the day that the photographer, his name is Roland Sherman, I have since learned, um, captured the picture while Dr. King was speaking. I'm not sure what he was saying, but my mom brought me to the march. We're from Detroit, Michigan, which is where I am right now. And I had listened to Dr. King on numerous occasions, mainly on the news, but surprisingly, he was in Detroit, Michigan in June of that same year. And he led a march down Woodward Avenue for anybody that may be on this, this uh, call from Michigan or Detroit in that area. But he led a march down Woodward Avenue <clears throat> that ended up at Cobo Hall. And you'll never guess what he said during that speech. That's right. He said, I have a dream. He said that several times. As a matter of fact, that was the second time he said it. The first time he used an I Have a Dream speech was in North Carolina. But digressing back to the famous march in Washington, I was um, glad to be there. I was glad my mother brought me. I, when I listened to Dr. King speak, I listened to him <clears throat> as more of a minister. And being raised in church, his messages always had some scripture to it. So his message to me was honest and sincere. And I understood what he meant when he said he had a dream because I believed that I lived the dream in like growing up in Detroit. There was a difference or contrast with people living in Southern states versus people living in Northern states like Michigan. So while people in Southern states were not able to 
um, go to school or take the ride the bus, if any of you are familiar with the Montgomery bus boycott, or sit at lunch counters and have a hamburger or a soda or pop, whatever you may call it. I was able to do that in Detroit and there weren't any consequences. We took the bus, we took public transportation and there weren't any incidents. So I was glad that my mom brought me. So I had the opportunity to stand with her and over 250,000 other people to say that those injustices that Dr. King spoke of were not right. They weren't fair. So I was one, one of those voices. So that serious look on my face, I'm basically a serious person anyway, but that serious look on my face was the understanding that I had um, of how important it was that we were all equal, that we were all the same. And, and it didn't matter what color we were. And he actually said that, and that's one part of the speech that I hold on to so much when he said he wanted his four little children to be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. So back then, black people were referred to as Negroes. And I was not taught and most of my contemporaries or other people my age were not taught that because you were a Negro, you were beautiful because that kind of insinuated that you were and other people were not. So we were just taught, or I was certainly taught that just being who I was was important, that being a little girl um, was important and the color of my skin did not dictate who I was. It was just something that happened to be a part of who I was. And that helped me grow into a person that embraced equality so much better where I didn't look at people based on their color. I didn't look at myself based on my color. I was just a person with the same rights and freedoms as every single person that I encountered then and that I encounter now. So everybody is beautiful, regardless of what color you are, regardless of what race you are, regardless of what creed you are, regardless of how tall you are, how short you are, the color of your hair, your facial characteristics, you're all beautiful. We are all beautiful. And that I thought was an extremely important message that Dr. King gave and that part of it is something that I have taken with me all of these years, and it's made a, a huge difference. And I share it with everyone, uh, with my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. That's beautiful. Um, we already have a question. Someone okay. wants to know, how old were you when that photo was taken? I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was 12 years old. As a matter of fact, that was my birthday. That was my 12th birthday. So I was even more excited to be at this place, this with all of these people and had something to look forward to because I knew when the march was over, I was going to get some ice cream and cake, but it was still exciting to be there. And I was there early. And let me tell you why. My aunt, Edith, whom I'm named after, uh, worked for the Red Cross. And she had an assignment to be at the, at the march. So she had to come early. So we were there before most of the people even descended on the mall. And so it was amazing to see buses pull up and cars and people get off the bus. And, and I'm five feet tall then. I guess I was maybe four, nine. But to see a sea of people just converge and they were all around me until I couldn't see anybody anymore except for the people that were around me. And it was a very, very hot day. It was very hot. Um, but so that was amazing. And, and the, the, the day was set up in two parts. Um, we started off by the Washington Monument where there was like, um, there was some singing with people that I'm sure you've never heard of, but I'll say Peter, Paul and Mary, people that I was uh, aware of. And then there was the march and we assembled then over by the Lincoln Memorial. 
So it was a great honor for me to march with Dr. King twice and to hear him speak and then to hear people saying one of which, again, someone that you probably aren't familiar with, but her name is Mahalia Jackson. And she was someone that I had seen her movies and my mom had her albums. We had albums back then. Sure, you don't know what those are either, but <laughs> it's okay. But if I'm going to tell my story, I have to tell my story. Um, but albums, that's a vinyl thing that you put on a record player and then you put the needle on it and a penny or a nickel or something and keep it balanced so you could hear it. Um, but the, let me let me say this. The other thing that amazed me, and this is something you can relate to, 250,000 people is an awful lot of people to be organized to come to one place. That's an awful lot of people. And what makes it an awful lot of people, and, and, and I don't know if you knew this, but it was on a Wednesday. It was on a weekend. It was on a Wednesday. It was the middle of the week. And the reason it was in the middle of the week is because President John F. Kennedy and Dr. King and some of the other civil rights leaders had a conversation in the White House. And there was concern about a lot of people converging on in you know in Washington DC that there might have been a disturbance because there were disturbances in other parts of the southern states and in other parts of the country. So they thought having it in the middle of the week, there wouldn't be that many people that came. But what they didn't realize is there were so many people from around this country, all races, colors, creeds, religions, everything that believed that injustice to one was an injustice to all. And they came by bus and plane. And we actually took a Greyhound bus, if you're familiar with that. Um, but we took a Greyhound bus to Washington, D.C. from Detroit. Um, but <clears throat> that was in itself a lot. And But what makes it so special is the fact that we didn't have cell phones then. We had telephones a telephone that has a line that runs into the wall and you pick it up and, you know, you would dial the number. Then there was a dial. It was rotary. That's, you know, if you make the circle and you dial the number um, before it advanced to touchstone. But anyway, uh, and I'm sure you don't know about it either, but imagine with the kind of injustices that we're facing right now today. And now we have cell phones. I have a cell phone. I'm sure most of you have our handy little cell phone with our contacts in it, several hundred, few thousand, whatever. Imagine if we were able, had been able to use a cell phone to reach out to our friends and neighbors and relatives and say, there's going to be a march in Washington, D.C. because there are things that are going on in our communities that we don't like, and we're going to have a peaceful demonstration and get the attention of the government and the world, and we're going to make a difference. So if we could, have, if we could achieve reaching 250,000 people just by using a telephone, and some people, mind you, had party lines. I know you don't know what that is, let me tell you. A party line is when I have a phone with a phone number. And someone around the, down the street or a few blocks away has the same phone number. And our lines are connected. So I might be on the phone talking with a friend and then that person will pick up the phone and say, well, I need to use the phone. And then I'd have to get off. That's called a party line. But anyway, we were able to use just a telephone, a basic phone or a telegraph a telegram um, to communicate. And of course, Dr. King was traveling around the country inviting people to come. When he came to Detroit, he invited people to come to this big march that was being planned in Washington, DC, which is why my mother decided to, you know, that we would make that trip. So with your cell phone and your few thousand contacts and everybody that you know, if you decided that we're going to organize and we're going to make this country better because we don't like guns in our schools or, you know, we want our, the quality of our education to be better. You, if we could get 250,000 people, you think you might be able to get, I don't know, two and a half million people? Absolutely. It could be so easy. Um, but it's important 
to know what to do and to organize and first and foremost to make sure that it's peaceful because that's why the civil rights movement was so successful. It was, it was peaceful. It was not about being mean and cruel as people were being to those people that were demonstrating for equal rights. And another thing that I had to say about them, especially those in the South that endured that, that mistreatment, it took courage. It took so much courage to stand and take physical abuse, to be hosed uh, with, with water hoses, I mean, by a water department. So the pressure is so much greater than just the water hose that you might use, you know, in, in doing your lawn. To have someone bring dogs and sick them on you, they would do that if they would go and sit at a lunch counter knowing that they weren't supposed to be there, but they were determined, I have a right to sit at this counter. They knew that they might be spat on or hit or kicked, but they never, ever retaliated. And that took a huge amount of courage because if they responded, if they retaliated, it weakened the strength of the movement and they, they couldn't do that. So actually people went through training so they would know how to respond or how not to respond. And that's what made for a successful civil rights movement, the determination, the courage, and the outstanding leadership of a Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here that uh, I love because I know the answer to this one too. <laughs> um, someone wants to know if you still have the flag that you are holding in that picture. I did have that flag until I think about five years ago. I donated it to, I gifted it to the National Museum of African American History and Culture there in Washington, DC. It has been on exhibit a few times. I hope they make it a permanent exhibit. Um, but yes, that, that flag or pennant came back home with me, of course, and we kept it all these years and my mom did. And it was a part of my, how I spent my summer vacation. So I had it posted on a, a put on a poster board and I typed up a little report that talked about, you know, that great march. And I kept that until I lost it sadly in a house fire, but the, the banner um, is still here or there in Washington, DC. So oh, great. I just was fortunate to hear you talk about it when you brought it to, to DC. So yeah. um, I have some friends from DC, fourth graders who want to know, after the speech, was there a big celebration because people were happy that someone was speaking up for Black people? There wasn't, that I know of, a celebration to follow. There may, well, I, what I believe and what I noticed people do was they were returning home. They had a message to take back to their respective cities and states. And so, no, there wasn't a, a street celebration, if, if that's what you're talking about. But people were excited from what they were hearing from Dr. King and other speakers. So that excitement just stayed with them. And then they shared it um, on the way home, I'm sure, on the long bus rides home or train rides home. They were, it, it was just exciting. I was excited. Um, did you ever participate in a sit-in or any type of peaceful protest? Yes, I have, have participated in peaceful protests and marches as recently as a few years ago um, here in Detroit or in the Detroit metropolitan area uh, because there are still things that we have to protest about. Um, so yes, over the years I have, uh, some were about programming on TV, uh, not being suitable for children. Um, one of the marches and demonstrations, and it was more than one, uh, was about the emergency manager law that we have here in Michigan that caused, if any of you are familiar with the Flint water crisis, um, our governor was able to appoint someone 
that had unilateral power. And Dr. Ranger Jen, if you would help me with another word for unilateral for them, um, that had more power than the people that we elected because voting is, is enormously important. And I know that every one of you is gonna vote when you're able to, uh, because that's how you make a difference in your, in your community um, on the local, state and federal level. But <clears throat> this person had more authority than the people that we elected, whether it was our, our uh, city council or our school board or our city council, I said that, or a mayor. And this person was able to circumvent uh, what we had done uh, in, in our election and had more control and authority and changed or undid what our elected people did. So yes, we marched and demonstrated, got it on the ballot and got it voted down. And I'm not gonna go into the referendum and all of that, but yes, I have. And I will continue to march for anything that that there need be. That's so inspirational for our young people to hear about. I mean, um, it really was. I mean, one of my questions was going to be, you know, what impact did being at the march have on you? And it really, I mean, I've heard you talk about how it very much impacted your life and put you in the direction of, of the kind of things you've been working on, right? Absolutely. I consider myself and have always considered myself a civil rights activist. Um, the amazing thing, though, is that photograph that you saw before, um, and uh, you can see it back here on, on, on the wall. I didn't know that that photograph had been taken until 2008, when a relative saw it in, on a Black history calendar. And she phoned me and said, Edith, your picture is in a calendar on a calendar on the cover and I of course thought she was joking because why would my picture be on a black history calendar with Dr. King and Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass and all these other famous people that you've heard about and I'm just you know me um so I looked it up and sure enough there there I was on this calendar um so that just kind of confirmed for me that I was fulfilling my life's destiny. And we're all put here for a purpose and we need to, to fulfill and live out that purpose. So that was my confirmation. It's such a great story that that was taken and you didn't find it for so much longer. Right. Um, so you told us a little bit earlier about um, how you came back for the 50th anniversary. We're getting ready. This year's gonna be the 60th, I can't believe it. Um, I'm sure you can't believe it. No. <laughs> what was it like? You told us about coming back for the 50th anniversary of the march with your children or grandchildren. Grandchildren. Um, grandchildren. How was that? Or what was that like? That was pretty amazing for all of us. Um, somehow or other, again, through modern technology, if we had that tel telephone thing that I told you about before, people from actually around the world were able to find me. Um, which was pretty amazing. So I was able to share my story with people from France and, you know, just, just all over. And my grandchildren were excited because, you know, they got to be there with, with their grandma and um, see a different side of me other than the, the grandmother that took them bowling and took them to church and we baked cookies and all that other stuff. They saw people interviewing me and wanting to know what I thought and the same kinds of questions that you and Ranger Jen have asked, uh, but they were also asking them questions like, well, what is it like to have a famous grandma? And that was kind of like, never really thought of her that way. <laughs> but it was educational for them. Uh, there were some things, some activities that I had planned for them. Um, so that was, you know, that was pretty exciting. But just to be there 50 years later, of course, my mom has, is no longer here. Uh, and she couldn't be here with me, be there with me. But having my grandchildren there, it's like continuing a legacy. So I'm looking forward to coming back um, again and celebrating my birthday. And I'm sure you all can do the math. So you'll know what birthday that is. Uh, I'll let you do the math. I'm not going to tell you because I know everyone is good at math. Um, but it to, to see Dr. King still celebrated 
after all of these years, and he will always be celebrated, is, is, is just amazing. And we have to keep him alive. We have to keep his dream alive. And we do that by the way we live each and every day. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to give you one more and then we'll, we're going to call it a day here, but this okay. is so fun. Um, someone wants to know, would you say your 12th birthday was your best one? <laughs> they want to know, since you traveled a long way and were there for a long time, did people bring things to eat? Yeah, people, not for my birthday, but <laughs> yeah, people, <laughs> yes, people brought things to uh, to eat because they had traveled for such long distances. So yeah, that was necessary. And, and I'm sure we had something, uh, something too. Um, was it my best birthday? In retrospect, it was certainly my most memorable birthday. I think my, my best birthday when was when I turned 21, you know, and then I was legal. You know, I could do things at 21 that I couldn't do otherwise. Um, all my birthdays have been special and have been a blessing. So I can't say any one more than the other, but certainly August 28th, 1963, my 12th birthday was my most memorable of all birthdays. I can always say, I know where I was on that day and what I was doing. I can't say that for my 39th. I don't know where I was, I don't know what I was doing <laughs> or my 42nd. <laughs> my 70th was pretty special though. But um, yeah, that, that was my most memorable. Well, they should all be special. And yeah. we have so enjoyed, I'm speaking for everyone, but we've so enjoyed listening to you and, and hearing your stories. And I've heard them before and I still love hearing them. <laughs> and we really appreciate all your, um, your time with us today. And, and I'm sure our students are inspired as, as the rest of us are. Um, yeah, you got to thank you from, from the, the, the class that asked about um, your birthday. Okay. And um, everybody's thanking you. So thank you very much for your time today. And we look forward to seeing you back in Washington for okay. your next birthday, I hope. Okay. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And I'm well, going to, uh, yeah, we're getting lots of thank yous. Okay, well, you thank you all to, for your interest, your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranger Jen and, and everyone else for this opportunity. I love speaking with children. So anytime, feel free. Thank you so much. I'm going to toss it to Destiny, who's going to pop on here from the trust. Um, okay. Thank you again, Miss Edith. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take Ms. care Destiny, now. You're on. Hi. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Ranger Jen, Ranger Susan, Miss Edith. We appreciate you so much for doing this. And um, to all of our educators, as well as our students who are online right now, thank you as well for coming here. We're very excited. And we look forward to having wonderful virtual classrooms with you in the future. I know we are working hard with Ranger Jen and other members of the National Park Service to provide even more education opportunities. So thank you so much. And we hope you have a beautiful afternoon.